in terms of like if I do something uh-huh like this sense of like how in the world did I do that that's so not me like definitely. I can't even believe I did it definitely more than I want to admit <laughs> definitely so the same way you can identify certain moments certain actions all of us have Every one of us have certain things we can identify as like, whoa, how did I do that? That's not me. Maybe it used to be me, but I'm sure it's not me now. And I definitely don't want it to be me. And I definitely don't view it as me. So how did I do that? So we were talking last week about Elul, about the special opportunity of Elul, about the king in the field, about God here with us, smiling, compassionate, loving about the 13 attributes of kindness shining down on us in like the most warm, embraceive way. And all of that is sort of the backdrop to the work we need to do. So we're going to speak a little bit about that work and analyze what really is the point of sin, which with, with a really, really interesting midra. So this month, one thing we do, which is sort of almost like a preliminary step to repentance, is what's called cheshpan hanefesh. Cheshpan hanefesh, soul searching, what does that mean and how do we do it? To properly prepare, to properly repent, to rectify, you first need to figure out what's going on. And that's the idea of soul searching. There's many different ways to accomplish it. And I'm going to suggest one or two or three because there's lots of ways to do it. One of the Lubavitcher Rabbeim defined the simplest soul searching as determining three things. Where you should be, ideally, where you must be, minimally, and where you are. If you know where you are, and you know where you're aspiring to, and you're knowing where you're going to, like, at least be safe, then you could start working. Or, you can't figure that out, like, too deep, too difficult, you could think of a few things you want to focus on. Take three improvements for this month. Sometimes we get, like, ah, choke too much, as, as we discussed at length last week. But three things, and work on changing, at least for a little or something that maybe is the most basic way to do it, the most practical way to do it, is think of the significant areas of your life, uh, health, children, finances, social bias. Think of, are we good in that area or do I need more blessings in that area? Okay, if I need more blessings in that area, what can I do to help that area? If I need more blessings with my children, what can I do that would make the most sense in terms of spiritual improvements that would relate to my children? If I need more blessings for health, what will make the most sense that our spiritual improvements I can make that sort of trickle into the concept of health and then write them down and daily, every morning, as you start your day, review the list to focus you. And again, you could say it's for this month for this month now already today was the 13th there are 29 days we're talking about 16 days left you might want to say through Yom Kippur you know extend it a little bit anyone have any other ways they have done cheshpan hanefesh soul searching in the past that's worked for them because I know like a lot of times we have these terms and we throw them around but we want to make them practical it's good to like gain from each other's experiences so anyone's done something in the past that helped them I've been kind of similar to what you're saying like I'll see where like where things are not really flowing too well or Hashem's not really going along with my plan, things I want. And I'll say, okay, let me try to figure out why this is happening. Why, you know, kind of like that. Like What's where, going where, wrong I, or what can you do to make it better in that area? Yeah. I mean, what other way, how else would you know? How else would you introspect without knowing, without looking at what you've been dealing with the past year or the past month or things that have been stressing you out and making you crazy? Right. No, no, that's what I'm saying. It's in a sense, it's the most pragmatic thing. Other people would say, look at all different important spiritual services. Uh, where are you holding in davening? Where are you holding in Torah study? Where are you holding in charity? Where are you holding in interpersonal? That's another way of doing it. But for us as you know, just practical people leading a practical, busy life or lots of different things happening. If we look and we say, wait, this isn't working. But like you're saying, this isn't the working the way I want it to work. Well, then God's clearly telling me I need to do something to enhance the spirituality here. Because if I can enhance the spirituality, it will flow into the physical life. Our spiritual advantages promote our spiritual health and our spiritual health determines our physical health. 
what's going on physically in our life. So if something's not working with one of my kids or something's not working in my health or something's not working in my house or in my finances or what can I do to go to the roots? How do I improve the situation spiritually? And then I trust and know it will trickle down and there'll be a change in the physical as well. But is it is always like that? Like this morning, my daughter- Yeah, says, I was going to ask. Because yeah, she made like this whole amazing breakfast, took her a very long time and she went outside to eat it and the wind like blew the whole thing on the floor. And I was like, oh my God, that's such a like bracha, the Hashem, you know, maybe there's something in the food that wasn't good for you and you would, you would have had the worst stomach ache or whatever if you would have eaten that. And she goes, not everything's like that, mom. You can't always say that like Hashem is preventing something. Like, I was like, um, I mean, I really do think that, but like, I guess maybe, maybe there's a better way, maybe there's another explanation or a better every, way to explain every, it. Everything is Hashem. It could go in either direction, but everything is Hashem, meaning either it's Hashem, like you're saying, protecting you, or it's Hashem giving you a little patch. It could be either one, but everything is Hashem. Nothing, the most minor thing. You know, you had one egg left in the carton and it had a blood stop, you know? Is that God? Yeah. It's, uh, you know, you uh, one of your kids uh, borrowed a piece of jewelry, went outside, and it got lost. Is that Hashem? Absolutely. Why does Hashem care? Hashem Hashem is too low of that answer. One is every aspect of the whole world is pulsating with Hashem energy. Every aspect of the whole world is Hashem. Like, like, like this glass, right? I'm just something, it's, it's a glass. It's part of Hashem's energy. Otherwise it wouldn't be. So just as we are aware, if my toe is hurting, I feel it. It's just the toe. I know, but it's a part of me. So I feel it. So all of creation, Hashem feels much more intently than I feel my toe because it's all him. Then you up that a lot when you're talking about a Jewish person because every Jew is the entirety of creation for Hashem. That's what it's written. That's what it says in the Gemara. Every one of us is supposed to say, Bishvili nivra ha'elam. For my sake, the world was created. The Gemara discusses why if God made everything in twos, you know, two giraffes, two elephants. Why do he make just Adam? Oh, oops, yeah, let's create Chava. What, what was Hashem thinking? So our Chachamim say, the sages say, just as there was only Adam, one person, and the entire world was for him, so too every one of us should know the entire world is for us. The entire world is orbiting around us. We are the point and purpose, which means we have to actualize why God created the world because it's all around me so if you if and of course that could be like a really hard idea to internalize because maybe you don't want to internalize it because it's like too much but it's really pivotal that piece of Tanya that discusses this concept at length that I'm just saying now briefly it is the most frequently advised section of Tanya when the love sheriff is telling someone something about Tanya <laughs> You know, you're worried, learn, study, memorize, review this piece, or you have ulcers, or you have financial issues, or you have spiritual issues. It's like, it's like chicken soup for the soul. Whatever you have, go to that piece of Tanya. Why? Because it's the most foundational thing for a person to understand. I am so significant. What I do is so important. Ultimate merit, ultimate responsibility. God is looking at me. He's looking inside of me, inside my heart inside my my intestines, my inwards, my guts. How am I serving him? And if you think about it like that, then you realize that, yeah, if a fly went into your soup, there's God. And if the soup spilled and splashed, there's God. And if you, it's all very deliberate design. So then you could say, why? When you're getting to the whys, again, you don't know. So you try to see what makes sense situationally. Is it that I've been so good lately that Hashem saved me? Here, I worked so hard on the breakfast, but I've really been trying to be really close to him. So maybe Hashem, like you said, maybe there's something there that wasn't good for me. Or conversely, maybe it was Hashem's way of giving me a slight little like reminder that I need to remember him more. Do you remember that whole story Miriam had with the bugs and the vegetables? She had something... That she was, she she had like a bag of vegetables. We had just discussed in class this idea of checking, and ah, she's like, ah, really, she's gonna be bothered. She threw it in, and I don't remember what happened. Like the whole pot started like boiling over and spilling, and it was a whole crazy mess. She's like, whoa! And then she said, Let me, is this the pot or is this the vegetables? So I didn't check them. And then like shook another package and she checked it, 
And then it just cooked normally. And it was like, it was just like so concrete in her eyes. Checked? Didn't check. So does it happen every time you don't check your vegetables? Of course not. It's, it's, it's pretty close and pretty cool when God's going to so quickly like tell you, yes, I'm looking, I'm watching, I love you, I need you. And please, please do what I'm asking because it's really, really important. So Mrs. Chern, when you say that there's a connection like with, let's say, health and spirituality, like how deep does that go? Because let's say someone's battling like, I don't know, let's say I'm like a simple thing, like, I don't know, like the, an allergy. I don't know, just anything that's like, not necessarily this like terrible thing. It's pretty manageable, but like, is that something you can work on spiritually or are they connected in that way? Everything you could work on spiritually. It says actually in the Gemara, if your head hurts, you should learn Tyra. Problem is we don't know which part of Torah to learn for your headache. I mean, it's going through the whole body. If this hurts, if this part of your body hurts, learn Tyra. If this part of your body hurts, learn Tyra. If this part of your body hurts, learn Tyra. We're like, whoa, Tyra cures a headache and a foot ache and a knee ache and a elbow ache. Yeah, Torah cures everything. But you have to know which part of Torah to learn to cure each part of your body. So that's the point. Is there like a book on that? Is there a book that's, no, the Gemara doesn't tell you which part. The Gemara just, it's literally, it's in the Gemara. It goes through various body parts and says, if this hurts, learn Tyra. If this hurts, learn Tyra. If this hurts, learn Tyra. It's not telling you which part. It's giving you a well, what book would list, be like a big Why do they list all the body parts? Because it's, it's all the it's same bringing, answer. It's bringing out a point. The point being, every <clears throat> part of you is connected to Tyra, is connected to spirituality. Don't say, well, this part has nothing to do with it. This part, I had a headache. Like, come on, why do you have to be so spiritual and nuts? I have a headache. You know, my, my, my back hurts. My back hurts. No, your back hurts. It has to do with relationship with Hashem. You have a headache. It has to do with relationship with Hashem. It all has to do with relationship with Hashem. So you could say, but I don't know how to cure a headache, you know, with, with, with spirituality. I don't know how to cure a backache with spirituality. True. But we know general rules and we know general approaches. So the general approach, as we said, is Hashem is doing this out of love for me. Hashem loves me. Hashem needs me. Hashem wants me to actualize myself. And again, maybe in Hashem's kindness, because for some reason something negative had to happen, Hashem just made it a headache that's going to go away. Thank you, Hashem. Or maybe in Hashem's kindness, Hashem wants to remind me that I need to remember him. So Hashem said he gave me a few headaches. And I'm like, why do I keep getting these headaches? Maybe... Maybe I, maybe I, I, it's Hashem's very kind way. It could be a lot worse of telling me, remember me. Something's off. Something's off spiritually. And that's why sometimes we off physically. It all goes back to Hashem and it all goes back to love. But you sort of have to sometimes look at yourself or speak with someone, you know, like a spiritual mentor. How do I process this? What can I do about it? And then there's always just the general add. Sometimes we add in things directly connected. Certain things are written down. Like, you know, and certain things are not. And you just think, okay, what, what, uh, my head, my head is supposed to be pure. Maybe I have uh, negative thoughts in my head. And that's what's, you know, creating the spiritual and therefore physical stress. Maybe I have anger or negativity. Maybe I don't have enough godliness. So you try to think, what could I do to shift the spiritual? And Hashem should guide me in the right way that it shifts the physical as well. Dina, did that answer your question? Yes, but also, well, ish, yeah, it answers like half my question, but my other half is like a Talmud Chacham that learns Torah every day presumably wouldn't have any ailments, right? If, if no, because not saying, necessarily are they re- learning the that part of Torah that helps that. Oh, ailment. okay, I got you. Okay, that makes sense. So it's not, in other words, it's a, it's not practical. Like if my head head of hair, so I should learn Torah because I don't know which part cures headaches. But it's hashkafa. It's a perspective on life. And the perspective on life very clearly is everything's in Kedusha. That's the source of everything. From Kedusha, everything flows to every to, to the rest of our world. So if we're suffering, again, maybe not for every headache are you going to take on five resolutions. But if a person is going through something, like, like if it's, you know, oh, um, your bus or your Uber or your train came late and therefore you were late to whatever. Annoying. Do you have to start doing deep soul searching over it? Not necessarily. You can just accept it as it's God and it's his goodness and Hashem wants to fight. But sometimes when something is more consistent than that or more troublesome than that or bigger than that, more significant than that, you say, wait, why is God doing this to me? 
why does Hashem keep making me late when I am so responsible and so on time and yet life makes me late again and again and again? What message is Hashem telling me? And what can I do spiritually that can heal whatever is the mess up in the physical domain? So this was going, we're speaking about the idea of soul searching here because this is the month of repentance. Now we want to repent before the high holidays, before Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, we want to repent. Because if we do it now, it's like going to court and the cop doesn't show up. Real repentance now allows God to judge us now, which means judging us without the prosecutor. Again, literally like we speak in America of if the cop doesn't show up, you're completely exonerated. You're completely off the hook. So if we can be in court without the, the Satan, without the force of evil, we know it's going to be a great year. And how could that happen? I mean, he comes to court with his files, you know, with all of his accusations against every one of us. Well, he's not coming to court in hell. He knows to come to court in Rosh Hashanah. He has a Jewish calendar. He knows when to come to court. It's Rosh Hashanah. He's not coming to court in hell. But if you already do your repentance now, God could judge you now because you already repented. And the Satan, the force of evil, isn't even there. This is actually the whole spiritual concept behind the idea that comes up when we discuss Rosh Hashanah of fooling the Satan, fooling the Satan. And there's quite a number of things within Jewish custom that we do differently around Rosh Hashanah to fool him. Like, for example, we don't blow shofar on the eve of Rosh Hashanah. Every day of El we blow shofar, except the last day of El, the 29th. We don't blow shofar then. Why? To fool the Satan, you should get confused and, and what? And not know the date of Rosh Hashanah? We don't bless the month. Every month, the last Shabbos of the month is Shabbos the Varfin, when we bless the coming month, except Tishrei. We don't bless it. The last Shabbos of Elul, you're not going to have a blessing in Shul for, 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 Rosh, for Tishrei. A Rosh Hashanah, we don't mention Rosh Chodesh at all. Rosh Hashanah, of course, is Rosh Chodesh. It's the first day of the month of Tishrei. That's a big merit. Rosh Chodesh is a big merit. We don't mention it at all. And we're told that we don't blow that shofar to fool the satan. That we don't bless the month to fool the satan. That we don't mention Rosh Chodesh to fool the satan. You could say, how are we fooling him? First of all, how do we every year manage to fool him? And again, he doesn't have a Jewish calendar. He can't check out the date of Rosh Hashanah. How are we fooling him? But the idea is we are giving up merits. We're not pulling on that merit of blowing shofar on the eve of Rosh Hashanah. We're not pulling on that merit of blessing the month of Tishri. We're not pulling on that merit of Rosh Hashanah. And the Satan says, whoa, I can relax. They're not pulling all the merits out of their toolbox. They're not fighting me so hard. So I'm not going to fight them so hard. That's how we fool him. So along these lines, the greatest fooling of the forces of evil is to get judged before Rosh Hashanah. Then he's completely fooled. It's completely unexpected. It circumvents the entire prosecution. Prosecution is little. There's a little prosecution for anything we did wrong that we did not repent for. The whole prosecution is circumvented and we merit it by our sincere efforts to repent now in El. And that's why, even though, of course, if you didn't repent in El, you have Rosh Hashanah. And if you don't do it completely Rosh Hashanah, you have the days of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And of course, if you didn't finish it off then, you have the intensity of Yom Kippur. So we have opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. So a person could be maybe a little procrastinating or busy, spaced out. It's not a holiday. It's a holiday incognito, as we explained last class, because we have all the spiritual energy of holiday in the air, but it's incognito. We're doing our regular stuff. So okay, whatever, I'll, I'll get to it later. But it's really worth getting to now because now, uniquely, only in Elul, not Rosh Hashanah, not in the days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, not in Yom Kippur, only now in Elul do we have this opportunity to get to court before the Satan shows up. So to understand repentance a little better, we want to understand what is a transgression? What is the sin? The more we understand the sin, the more we can understand repentance. So there's an interesting midrash in the Talmud Yerushalmi between God's wisdom power of prophecy, Tyra, and God himself on a sin. And the question is, if one sinned 
what should he do? So the Midrash says, they asked wisdom. Again, wisdom meaning divine wisdom. If someone sinned, what's his own punishment? Now, wisdom, the ultimate embodiment of wisdom in the human dimension is King Solomon, Shlomo HaMelech. So in Mishle, Shlomo HaMelech says, Chata'im tirdof ra, evil pursues the sins. So that's what wisdom says. Wisdom is embodied by King Solomon says, if you sinned, it's very harmful. Evil's going to pursue you. Okay, that's true. And they asked prophecy. One who sinned, what's his punishment? Now here we have prophecy. So we're quoting a prophet. The prophet being quoted here is Yechezkel. And Yechezkel said, the soul of the sinner is death. She shall die. So wisdom said sin is harmful. Prophecy said sin is death. Then they asked Tyra, one who sins, what's his punishment? And Tyra said, bring a carbon for atonement. As we're going to explain, Tyra is saying, it's a very foolish act. And then they ask God, if one who sins, what's his punishment? And God, uniquely, not wisdom, not prophecy, not Tyra, God said, do tshuva, and then you'll be atoned. God is telling us, you sinned? You have a fabulous opportunity now. You have the opportunity to do something very special, very cool, very unique. Do tshuva. Explore the opportunity of tshuva. So all four of these dimensions, wisdom, prophecy, Taira, Hashem, God, they're all true. <laughs> they're all part of the, the panorama of aspects of consequences of sin. Again, wisdom is saying sin is harmful. Absolutely true. Prophecy is saying sin is death. Absolutely true. Tyra is saying sin is foolish. Absolutely true. And God is saying sin is an opportunity. And that's also absolutely true. So let's try to unpack each one of these ideas. I don't know if we will finish, but we will see. Wisdom. Wisdom is saying sin's a really bad idea. Why? And this actually circles back to what we were just discussing. Because when you do bad things, bad things happen to you. Just like in the physical laws of nature. If you do bad things to your body, if you eat harmful foods, your body's going to suffer. And also in the spiritual laws of nature, spiritually beneficial deeds bring spiritual benefit. And the opposite brings spiritual harm. And since our physical life is really being energized by our spiritual life, spiritual behavior is affecting our physical life as well, like we were just talking about. So if you do good spiritually, it enhances your spiritual life, which is going to trickle down and enhance your physical life. And if you do the opposite, spirit, the opposite spiritually, it's going to harm your spiritual life, which is going to trickle down and affect your physical life. And we see this all the time. Have you experienced this in either direction? Meaning that you did good and saw good, or maybe not and saw the opposite? Well, it definitely happens. Definitely, 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 definitely happens. And sometimes, of course, it's so clear. Not always. God isn't always like, boom, like I just reminded about Miriam with checking the vegetables, not checking the vegetables, but sometimes he is for each one of us. I see it like sometimes, not sometimes. I think like the instantaneousness of it, like with the vegetables, I see that with like giving to Daka and Parnassa, like everything just seems to like, it's like done. And then all of a sudden like, boom, and you just like feel something random, like something totally like out of the blue sometimes something came a new opportunity or something came in the mail someone owed you like just something so out of the blue i'm not sure if that's what you mean but i definitely see that 100 percent. and i think actually stuck is probably like because god specifically says with charity you can test me that you gave it stuck and then boom this money came to you yeah i think a lot of people see that with stuck but again every single time maybe not every single time to still leave room for our free choice, but enough times that we're very confident in it, that we're very secure in it. And I agree with you. I think with Saka, with charity, it's a little simpler to see it because you could see the money and the money. You spent the money. Now your account doesn't have the money. How are you going to pay your bills? Boom, suddenly, somehow you got more money. And I, I've 
seen that many, 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 but it's true for everything. But again, it's true for everything, but not necessarily is it that instant response that you literally can connect the dots. Sometimes Hashem is more covert. I, I remember once I did something that I thought was very good, very difficult, very challenging, very good self-sacrificing for God, so to speak. And then a bit afterwards, one thing, I don't even remember, it was a few years ago, but I remember, I don't remember what happened. I just remember as things happened, I was like, oh, maybe that's because of that. Oh, maybe that because of that or like various good things happened in my life and I felt very sure it was probably connected to what I did but I wasn't I didn't know which one or maybe all of them you know so it's not always that we see that instant I did I got I did good I got good not so good not so good we don't always see the instant but it's always there always 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 there impossible for it not to affect everything we've ever done and that could be very reassuring for all the good that sometimes we do and we don't always feel god noticed cared was significant to him he notices he cares it's significant and every single thing we do in either direction affects us absolutely so that's wisdom's take on it wisdom is saying Sin's a bad thing. It's going to mess you over. Prophecy is more intense than that. It's more spiritual. Because prophecy is about our endeavor to commune with, our endeavor to be one with God. So prophecy is saying, sin's not just harmful. It's the ultimate harmful. Because for prophecy, when your whole focus is connecting with God, life means connection to God. So sin, which is turning away from God, disrupts that life. So sin is death. It's, it is. If life is God, if life is being one with God, then that which takes me away from being one with God is death. And this is how we should ultimately divide, define our life. And when it's so in white, sin isn't just bad. Sin is death. So that's prophecy. Then you have Tyra. Now, Tyra agrees with wisdom and prophecy. Tyra is the source of wisdom and Tyra is the source of prophecy. So no argument. But Tyra takes it a step further. Tyra says, our soul would never willingly, consciously sin. That's not me. In essence, every single one of us is a soul. So what's going on? How does a Jew, the human embodiment of a soul, ever, ever, ever sin? It's the antithesis of our being. So Tyra says, sin is folly. The sages say, a person does not transgress unless a spirit of folly entered into him. It's the only possibility. It's like temporary insanity. Go against what your soul wants. Because all my soul wants is God. Which means all my soul wants is to do what's going to connect me to God. And Tyra is guiding us to spiritual sanity, to self-discovery, to understand all I want is God. And this is the opposite. And to transcendence, to get past your offering the sacrifice, you're following Tyra's rules. You're saying, that was craziness. That was never me. Me? I want God. That's all I want, actually. Sin? Nothing to do with me. I'm not sure how it happened. A friend of mine was a mikvah attendant. She shared once how she was, you know, in the mikvah with you know women coming in, and there was a woman that came in and was incredibly, incredibly, incredibly rude to her, like, like really disgusting. Okay, it happens sometimes. You don't know what's going on in someone else's life, and you know the woman started preparing and she left, and and then maybe an hour later she comes in to take her to the mikvah. And the woman says to her, I want to apologize for that woman that was here before. She left, but I want to apologize for her behavior. And you could say, well, that's a little cop-out line. But she she sort of meant it sincerely, meaning what she was telling my friend is, it wasn't me. I'm so sorry. I don't know what happened because I can't talk like that. But that wasn't me. And that's really what's going on every single time any of us, any Jew, transgresses. 
any sin, that isn't us. And that's Tyro's perspective on a sin. It's it's not us. It's something that's not us at all. I feel that on a broader level as well. Like let's say someone famous did something wrong and went to jail or something like that. And he's Jewish or she's Jewish. It's like a personal embarrassment. And it's like a personal like sadness that like one of your own, you know, did something wrong, presumably, or whatever. It's like, you feel it like on a personal level. I don't know. Maybe that's just me. I don't know. Right. But do you see this also with yourself? In terms of like, if I do something? Uh Uh-huh. Like this sense of like, how in the world did I do that? That's so not me. Like, I can't even believe I did it. Definitely. More than I want to admit. (laughs) definitely so the same way you can identify certain moments certain actions all of us have every one of us have certain things we can identify as like whoa how did I do that that's not me maybe it used to be me but sure it's not me now and I definitely don't want it to be me and I definitely don't view it as me so how did I do that so the same way all of us have that with certain very specific things, like you're saying with, with sarcasm or whatever it is, like, oh, I don't want to be like that. Well, that's not me at all. In truth, every transgression is that, including the ones we think are us, the, the innocuous ones, the ones we accept as like, yeah, you know, I gossip, everyone gossips, that's normal. No, no, for Jew it's not. For Jew it's insanity. For Jew, it makes no sense. For Jew, it's not us. So that's what Tyra is saying. So again, wisdom said, sin, that's a really bad idea. It's going to really mess you over. Prophecy said, sin, sin is death. Your whole life is God. Sin is death. It's the absolute cutting off of your life, of your relationship with Hashem. Tyra says, those are all true, but it's even deeper than that. Tyra is saying, sin, sin has nothing to do with a Jew. Sin is not you. Sin is, 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 is insanity. It's foolishness. It's some other force that got into you. Because you, Jew, you're a soul. All you want is God. And what God says is that sin is for the sake of repentance. Sin is divine opportunity. And that we'll speak about next week. Tina? So the whole point of sin is so that we can repent and become closer to Hashem? Yes, that's the whole point. That's an incredible, like, mind-blowing thing. Sorry, I know we're ending, but that's, like, mind-blowing because that's, like, a level of, like, Hashem, I guess, put sin in the world for us to become closer. Like, Exactly. You got it. Exactly. It's an opportunity. Okay, cool. This is going to save me. This is going to save me a bunch of emotional rabbit holes. <laughs> I'm not going to go down. I just, I just, I'm okay, Hashem. I'm, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just in your plan. I'm doing your thing. Exactly. In other words, the, the philosophy behind it is Hashem runs the world. It doesn't just mean Hashem in broad strokes, you know, put planet Earth and planet Sun and governments into place. Hashem runs every detail of everything. Like we were talking about the glass. It's all part of him. So even though we have free choice, and we do, we have absolute free choice. Free choice means in the realm of our service of God, we can freely choose. Everything else is determined, but a lot of our life has to do with serving God. So a lot of our life, we do choose. But that doesn't take away Hashem's running the world. Concurrent with my free choice is Hashem's absolute hashkacha pratis. Right? I have free choice. Hashem has hashkacha pratis. Neither one negates the other. My free choice doesn't take away Hashem's hashkacha pratis. Hashem's hashkacha pratis doesn't take away my free choice. So why is Hashem letting his only child, me, the purpose of creation, me, the reason for creation, me? Why is he letting me mess myself up? Why is he letting me distance myself from him? Because there's something higher than Tyra. And higher than Tyra is Shuva. That's what we're going to talk about next week. So have a wonderful week where we do our soul searching, where we do our repentance, and then we can discuss next week why it is so ultimately cool and unbelievable this opportunity this new road Hashem lets us carve out every time we sin called repentance